Good evening. Captain Retired Matt Edwards here with the next installment of the Observation Post Weekly Update Facebook Live. So, I'll go through three items like usual, and then I'll do a bit of a discussion about the Pension Act. I'll probably go over a post I uh, made about the uh, the Canadian Force, well, the Veterans Ombudsman call that I never managed to get a hold of her again. She was going to lunch, so I couldn't continue the conversation, but I'll get into that later. So the first couple of things I was going to talk about is on my numbered list, number 472. The earnings loss benefit reason stated in the 2006 Canada Gazette is absolute rubbish as it implies or states explicitly that there is no right to short-term compensation for injury and lower or no right to compensation if you can look after yourself through your own pensions and insurance, which is contrary to the common law. Now, the common law case I'm talking about is Boltorelli v. Flanagan, Ontario Court of Appeal, 1973, and they said that there's no equitable reason that a person's earned benefits can be taken into account to reduce someone's damages. And what you have to remember, and what I'll get into later in the Pension Act discussion, is that when you get compensated for your injury, you're getting a lawsuit in tort replacement. If you get Hit by a civilian, you got to assume you get compensation through the courts. If you're a civilian, you get hurt on the job, you get compensated through workers' compensation. If you're a soldier and you get injured, you get compensated by whichever act you fall under, whether it's the Pension Act or the vet new Veterans Charter or the Veterans Wellbeing Act. Now, I know they want to save money. And I know they're doing what everybody else does. But if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? So what the government shouldn't do is break the law. So in the common law, you can't take someone's property into account. You can't take it into account then in bringing a law that contradicts the common law. Number 473. Income replace, replacement benefit has legal obligation to rehab, but CISIP does not. Now, I think I spoke about this recently, or maybe I just typed it up in a post recently. But I was reading through some Veterans Affairs documents, and they seem to think that rehabilitation under the Service Income Support Insurance Plan, Policy 901-102, that it's mandatory that you take rehabilitation. Nothing is further from the truth because insurance has to pay you when the risk happens. So if you don't do rehabilitation, you get paid your long-term disability. If you do do rehabilitation because you choose to, then you get your insurance. I'm pretty sure that this affected Veterans Affairs Canada's decision in 2006 to make rehab mandatory or you would not get your earnings loss benefit. Number 474, explain why clawbacks are bad public policy. Now, I've done this so often, I wonder if I should even do it, but it's bad for the economy because people have less money. If they don't have as much money, they don't spend as much. If they don't spend as much, then businesses don't need to sell them as much. If businesses don't need to sell them as much, then they don't need employees. They don't need to buy goods. So, the thing that everybody seems to be ignoring about clawbacks is that it hurts everybody except the person doing the clawback. So, they get what I would call an unjust enrichment, which is a form of equitable wrong. It could also be considered a statutory breach because all of these laws that I'm telling you about, federal laws, are being breached, like Canadian Forces Superannuation Act Section 83 prohibits the interception of the Canadian Forces Pension, but the Service Income Support Insurance Plan, which is a government insurance, ignores the government law. 
So one of these days, I'm predicting that they will get caught violating the law. Canada Pension Plan Act, Section 65.1, says nobody can touch the Canada Pension Plan. However, in 1991, the government decided to put an exception to that in Section 65.3. The problem with that, I just thought of this recently. I can come up with about six or seven different reasons why it's wrong, but I don't think there's a definition of disability income provider in the Canada Pension Plan. So they say that, you know, they will pay a payment after you execute an assignment to a disability insurance provider. Basically, if they prepaid, prefund your insurance that they said they would have got it back, but while we're waiting for you to get approved, we paid you the full payment. So they figured that you owe them. So back in 1991, the government chose to put Section 65.3 into the Canada Pension Plan Act. And I say it's illegal. Now, why is it illegal? Because in the common law, pensions are only payable to the pensioner. And this is why the government has laws prohibiting a pension to be diverted. However, they decided to change one of those, uh, a reason for a diversion in 1981, under the Garnishment, Attachment, and Pen Pension Benefit Division Act, GATA. They decided, in the interest of society, that they would allow one specific exception to the rule against assignment of a federal pension. Now, they didn't do it for the Pension Act, but they did do it for all three federal superannuation pensions. So they say words to the effect, subject to the Garnishment Attachment and Pension Benefit, Div Benefit Diversion Act and the Pension Benefit Division Act. So there's two acts that uh, deal with divorce. No one can touch these pensions. Now, I'll close down my number list and then I'll wing it about the other issues I was going to talk about. First, I'll discuss the Pension Act a bit. I made all these groups over the years. One of them was called Observation Post because that's my brand. And I put pension issues. Because even though the Pension Act isn't... Uh, the new payment for newly developed, newly disabled Canadian Forces members, you know, veterans, it is still in effect for people that are getting it and RCMP members. So, with that in mind, I had a look at earlier <coughs> the Act. It says in the Act itself, this is an Act to provide pensions and other benefits to or in respect of members of the Canadian Navy, Army, and Air Forces and the Canadian Forces. Now, let me tell you, first of all, I think that's a very vague definition or introduction or purpose of the act. Because they say it's to provide, which means that they're going to give it to you out of the goodness of their heart. Generally speaking, that's what provide means. And other benefits, so they're going to provide pensions and other benefits. But then, here's the legal part. To, or in respect of, members of the Canadian military. Now, what that's referring to is when you make a connection to two different items. So when you get paid in respect to service, that's the connection between your income and your service. So when they're saying that you're going to get a pension in respect to Canadian Forces service, they're talking about disability suffered during that service. They're not talking about just getting a superannuation type pension. They're talking about getting a disability pension. Now, paragraph uh, section two then goes on to say, the provisions of this act shall be liberally construed and interpreted to the end that the recognized obligation of the people of Canada to provide compensation to those members of the forces who have been disabled or have died as a result of military service 
and to their dependents may be fulfilled. Now, that's almost like the uh, preamble should have been, because it's talking about the purpose of the act, the spirit and intent of the act. But I got news for you. They didn't have to put this there. Because Canada has a quasi-constitutional law called the Interpretation Act. And Section 12 of the Interpretation Act says all laws shall be liberally construed and applied so as to achieve their intent. So the government didn't have to put that into the Pension Act. It's good that they did. I mean, a lot of people get upset that it wasn't in the Veterans Wellbeing Act. So Stephen Harper put it in there in 2015 or 2000, and I think it must have been 2015. I think he was out by 2016. So, the thing is, is they didn't need to do it, but they did it. So they put it in here that it shall be liberally construed, which means interpreted. Well, they say interpreted too. But the other key word is the word obligation. Now, that's the duty to compensate it isn't something that they can choose to give like it yeah it's our decision it's it's a it's a privilege not a right it's a right based system so when they were putting in the pension act don't know if they did it back in the 1919 1920s era whatever but it's roughly the same as a workers' compensation system, but for military people. So workers' compensation, you have the civilian gives up the right to sue, and the employer and all the other employers pool all of the premiums and set up a workers' compensation system, and you're supposed to get it automatically if you get hurt on the job. So if you get hurt in military service, you're supposed to get a pension act pension. That's not something the government gives to the veteran it's something that they paid for with the right to sue now how much is the right to sue worth it's worth however much you get if you have to exercise it so if somebody hits you in a car and you sue the driver for their negligence then whatever damages you prove in court you get and that's how much your right to sue is worth now, that's too complicated for the government, so they set up a system which was much simpler. So they assigned a value for a 100% pension. They set that value at the after-tax income of a public servant. Then they brought in a, a document that they called the Table of Disabilities, and then they look at the numbers in that they have people, I guess, experts who designed it. It's got a lot of criticism. I'm not going to get into it now because I'm not an expert on it. But it's basically, it gives you a number, and then you consult the percentage that they assign to you, and then that works out to a dollar value every month. It's a lifetime payment, and it's meant to be have supplements. So the government decided to do it on the cheap. And they decided to have not just a big pension everybody gets. They decided to make a basic pension. That's like every person a single person will get. Then if you're married, you get a spousal pension. If you have children, you get a children's pension. And after you die, your wife gets a, a widower's pension or something. A spousal. Uh, anyway. But that one's a separate pension. The other ones are paid as supplements to the basic pension. The widow's one is 75% of whatever the basic rate is for the veteran. So the thing is, it's a lifetime payment, which has pros and cons. Everybody might say, this is terrible. The new veteran charter does things differently, and it's not a lifetime payment. And then they addressed it because people kicked up a stink about it. But if you were going to court and you want a case for damages, 
you get a lifetime payment because they gave it to you all in a lump sum after you win. It's a lifetime payment. You just get it as a chunk of money. So if you die a couple of months or a year or two later, then, I mean, your family would inherit the money. That would be a bonus to a lump sum. But the government decided to do it differently and pay it out, dole it out each month, which means that if you kick the bucket, then they save money in the future. If they paid it all up front, they'd be complaining about, oh my God, look at all that money paid, and then he only lasted a couple of years or something. If we had been paying that monthly, we would have saved a lot of money. So it's not like there's a perfect system that one way is better than the other way because they both have their advantages and they both have their disadvantages. Now, one of the things that I want the government to fix is I want them to base it on the before tax income, even though people don't get awards under it anymore. It rolls me up. It offends my sense of justice because a common law tort lawsuit does not include tax. Tax is a charge against earned income. It isn't a component of income. It is a charge against your income. So if you get hurt by somebody else, you're not getting income from your service to that person who's paying you. You're getting a payment from that person because they hurt you. Now, if you hurt someone, you have a duty to repay them. Okay? Legal, moral, equitable, you call it what you want, but you have to make it right. And that's the thing about the Pension Act. The Pension Act was in place from 1919, and it's still a law. And on paper, it's tax-free. But it's not really tax-free because it's based on the after-tax income of a public servant. Now, one of the things that's been bugging me about what the Canadian Forces Ombudsman said in the reports and letters that it followed up, uh, the clawback of, under the Service Income Support Insurance Plan, as they try to make the case that the payment under the Pension Act is for pain and suffering. Well, it's not really up to us to decide what an act is meant to to do. We can have our opinions, sure, but what it's really up to is the people who create it, and then if there's any doubt about that, it has to go to court, and it has to be judged by a judge in an interpretation of the law. And under the Pension Act, there's a separate section called the Exceptional Incapacity Allowance that was brought in in 1970. And it was supposed to pay for five different things, but one of the things that it pays for is uh, pain and discomfort. Now that sounds like pain and suffering to me. And just to go back to a tort lawsuit, pain and suffering can be a form of compensation under a tort lawsuit. So not only would you sue the person for the economic damages that they did to you, but you would also, at times anyway, sue for pain and suffering damages. Now, when I was thinking about doing this broadcast, a lot of people think I'm awful negative about this stuff, including my member of Parliament staff. But let me tell you, adding an, a pain and suffering award to the Pension Act in 1970 was very forward thinking. Why is it very forward thinking? Because workers' compensation does not have any type of award for pain and suffering. And, and the Pension Act prior to 1970 had zero payment for pain and suffering. So the fact that the government went out and created a precedent of sorts and created a payment to add to the pension I think good on them, okay? Because it's a good thing. Now, the problem is that they made it a very strict rule to award it. In order to get it, you had to have a 98% or higher disability as assessed in that table of disabilities I talked about. Now, who assigns 
the percentage Veterans Affairs Canada. So if you want to save money for the taxpayer, what can you do? Well, you can sign some of 97% or 1 to 97% and then you would save on the pain and suffering payment, wouldn't you? Now, that's what both I and the legal system calls bias. The people who be, are making these decisions should not benefit. If, you, if they make a decision adverse to you, they should not financially benefit. I think it's a no-brainer, isn't it? But the way they have this system set up, not just the Pension Act, it's everything that the government does, basically, as they set it up so that they can save at your benefit. Well, I was talking about the earnings loss benefit earlier, which is now called the income replacement benefit. It is my understanding from extensive research that they copied the service income support insurance plan in 2006 and they brought it over to Veterans Affairs and they set up a system to replace the old Pension Act. Now what they did to the best of my knowledge is they brought in the disability award they called it to replace the Pension Act pension. They brought in the earnings loss benefit to replace the service income support insurance plan policy 901-102. They brought in the permanent impairment allowance to replace the exceptional incapacity allowance and they put into the Veterans Wellbeing Act that if you get an exceptional incapacity allowance under the Pension Act, you do not legally, you cannot in any way qualify for a permanent impairment allowance under the Veterans Wellbeing Act. See, that's proof to me that they meant it to be a replacement for the other payment. But the problem was is that they changed the goals or the stated goals of these payments. So they said that the permanent impairment allowance wasn't for pain and suffering. They said it was for the economic losses, for per lack of promotions and lack of seniority. Now, lack of promotions, so you could have got hurt early in your career, you could have been a private or a corporal, and you might have got up to sergeant, master, or officer, or something else. So, the permanent impairment allowance is supposed to pay you for the loss of those opportunities to increase your rank. And seniority is the payments within the rank. As a captain, there were 10 incentive pay codes. So, you could be have been a captain at second year as a captain, IPC2, then you became injured. So the purpose of the permanent impairment allowance for you would be, well, you would have got a payment, a, a, a raise every year for the next incentive pay code. So this was the purpose of the permanent impairment allowance. Now, that really screwed the pooch here, because they were supposed to, according to the rules, pay the per pay permanent impairment allowance to anybody who couldn't make 67.67% of their old salary, which again, they decided. So there's that bias thing again. But anybody who was on the system, well, you didn't even get payments for the earnings loss benefit past two years unless you qualified as what they call totally and permanently incapacitated, or TPI. So in order to get it past two years, you had to be TPI, which meant that you had to be unable to do a job 67.67% of your old salary. So if you qualified for extended earnings loss benefit, they called it, then you should have been paid the total uh, the permanent impairment allowance automatically because they were linked. But Veterans Affairs Canada didn't do that. That would be too expensive. So there were reports over the years and they said, oh, only so many people have been approved up till now. This is ridiculous. And it was. So anyway, that's a little bit of discussion about the Pension Act, but now I'll go into the other point I was talking about, but it's also sort of related to the Pension Act, because I'm going to uh, tell you about the post I made and where I was coming from. I, I took a picture of the notes I made freehand, but my writing is terrible. 
so I typed in so that people could read what I wrote. Now I sent this to a lady, the communications officer with the Office of the Veterans Ombudsman, and I'm hoping that they might investigate some of these things. So, here it is. Called the Office of the Veterans Ombudsman yesterday, but the lady was going to lunch, so I agreed to talk to her later. Drafted up this handwritten list for our call when it happens. Part of the reason I'm posting this is now writing sucks. Now, number one, follow up the Canadian Forces Ombudsman report from 2003. Taking into account the 2002 Canada Pension Plan Disability Report statement of fact about the Canada Pension Plan Disability cost of living allowance causing an erosion of benefits when there is a cap on the cost of living allowance such as with the CISIP long-term disability. As I see it, this can be the Office of the Veterans Ombudsman investing, investigating because A, CISIP long-term disability makes up the majority of the income replacement benefit, 75 over 90. So that means VAC must do its own due diligence. B, the Canada Pension Plan Disability Report that was about 20 years ago, so there can be no excuse about this still happening. They were fully aware of the problem. C, in theory, there is no problem, as Section 24B and 44B of the CISA policy states that the cost of living allowance on a clawback will not be considered relevant to income and will not be clawed back. So if they follow the rules, I wouldn't be talking about it. D. VAX own Veterans Wellbeing Act regulations mirror CISIP's policy section 24B and 44B from 2006 to 2019 in the Veterans Wellbeing Act regulations section 27.3. But they repealed this regulation in 2019 which is bad public policy according to the Canada Pension Plan Disability Report. See, the government's doing something bad. Now, point number two. The 2003 Canadian Forces Ombudsman Unfair de Deductions Report failed to consider the reward. I said it's a bad word, but I'll use it anyway. For getting a payment in addition to the Pension Act pension compensation for injury being due to A, Canada owing a legal burden, legal and equitable debt to the Canadian Forces member injured in military service. Then I put in brackets patriotism, sharing the burden of national defense. B. The injured veteran paid for the pension with the right to sue in tort. So basically I'm saying that since clawing back the pension was horrible because they were clawing back a payment that was only made to people hurt in service. And anybody with a brain should have said, you know, if they hadn't have been in the military and got hurt in service, then they wouldn't be getting a pension like pension. They wouldn't be getting assisted. I think they should get both. Right? I don't understand what they're thinking. Three. Can the Canadian uh, Office of the Veterans Ombudsman investigate this up? with or without coordination with the Canadian Forces Ombudsman, having an outside agency do it might result in a better investigation. Now, I'm not speaking of, off the top of my head here. I mean, that's just common sense. If you're investigating yourself, then I think you're not going to do a very good job. Number four, the overall purpose of the pensioner is peace of mind. Really? as this is an indemnity insurance paid as a replacement for a tort lawsuit. Now what I'm getting at is that all of these payments that we get, like if we pay into the Canada Pension Plan, we pay into the CISIP Long-Term Disability, we pay into the Canadian Forces Pension, they're all for peace of mind, for the future, just in case. You could die early and you might not get anything, but if you pay the premiums for an insurance, then you should get the insurance. If you pay into a pension, you should get your pension. Now, I'll give you an example, because I was looking it up today again. My Reserve Force Pension Plan, I had a devil of a time to get it. They told me I didn't qualify, that I only had a choice between a deferred annuity or a return of contributions. 
and because I know a thing or two about pensions, even back in 2012, I said to them, where is the choice for an immediate annuity? Oh, you don't get one of them. I said, why the hell not? I was, I only thought about this today. I mean, I never said it to them, I don't think, but I was, I was injured in service. Then I came medically disabled because of my injury in service. Why are they giving me the runaround about getting my pension? Okay? They should be throwing that at me as fast as they could, as far as I'm concerned. Now, here's the caveat. If you get medical release from the military, ordinarily you get the service income support insurance plan, policy 901-102, because it was made automatic on medical release in 19-fucking-99. Now, I got medical release on 19th of January 2012, so that was 13 years after that was made automatic. But when they made it automatic, like, they didn't put... They didn't make it automatic for the Reserve Force soldier. Because in Section 41A3 of the policy, they said that the injury, you had to be, have an injury or a disablement or a disease that occurred while you were in service on duty. Now, that's a very important form of discrimination. If you are, are a regular Force soldier, you get your assist automatically. If you're a part-time soldier, you don't get it automatically. You have to have got hurt in service. Now, the very first problem I saw about this years ago is under the Pension Act and the Veterans Wellbeing Act, you had to be hurt in service in order to get those payments from Veterans Affairs. Now, if Veterans Affairs is giving you a payment, I don't think CISA is going to pay you anything. So that clause saves them a lot of money. Now, to give you an example of how much it saves, there's only an average of 22 disabled reservists a year that get CISA. The highest number was 30. So, you know, there was another year with lower than 22, but the average per year is 22. Now, I worked it out, I think, uh, it's about three or four hundred people a year that gets medically disabled, medically released from the military as a part-time soldier. So basically, if you take 22 off the people that get it, off the 350 that don't, then you got about 330 people that didn't get the insurance that they paid for. Now, remember I said that I have a sense of justice? I don't think that's fair, even if I did get mine eventually. So I want them to fix that. I want them to make it automatic for every person that gets medical release. Okay. Paragraph 5. And then I'm going to call our quits because I want to keep this one short. I've noticed that my throat gets a bit sore when I'm doing all this talking. You know, talking head video where I'm doing all the talking and no interaction. So the Department of Justice bullshit in paragraph 87 of the Manoj Federal Court 2012 case affidavit I have is absurd and someone like the ombudsman might investigating th investigate things including now I use the word including because I mean it might be more but here are some of the things that occurred to me a who underwrites the CISA policy now, I know the answer is the government of Canada but they don't say that on paper B who pays 100% of the premium now, that's a rhetorical question because the government pays the premium, but it doesn't get the insurance. It's not paying the insurance to insure itself. It's merely passing on the money from the soldier. So, in the case of reservists, 100% of that payment is made by the government, but 100% of it was earned by me in service. So, that's important. It's important for taxes. C. Why does the government attempt to tax income replacement benefit and system under Income Tax Act Section 6 when compensation for a service injury is covered under the Income Tax Act Section a one d Okay? So they never took that out of the Income Tax Act. So there's an entire class of disabled veteran that gets payments under the Pension Act. So when they don't get a T-4 slip, you don't get any tax information slip at all. 
Now, the reason is, is that it's exempt from tax. And it's exempt from tax because of Section 811D. Now, as I said before, however, they don't tax it after they base the rate on the after-tax income. This is why I think that 30% needs to be added to the pension. D. Does the Crown have the right to reduce damages by using taxes in all cases or when it is the wrongdoer, like in the Manoj Federal Court 2012 case? To all of these questions, the answer is supposed to be no. The government is not supposed to take into account taxes if, if damages are involved. First of all, because the money is not income. You're not getting paid from your employer for services rendered. That is income. You're getting paid a debt repayment payment, and it happens to be of a capital nature. Now, in 1985, the government put out an income tax bulletin, ITB, IT365R2, and they state this, which is a common law position about tort damages, and they say that damages are not taxable, including the interest, including anything related to the damages. What they didn't put in there, at least as far as I can remember, is they didn't say the basis for why damages are not taxable. Damages are not income, they are capital. Your body is a capital asset. It's your property. So if someone injures your body, they have to give you back what they broke. So they broke your capital, they got to pay you back in capital. So you can't apply the income tax rules to the receipt of a capital lump sum or a capital monthly payment. You know, it would have been nice if they had said, listen, we don't cap tax the Pension Act pension because you're getting a capital payment each month. You're not getting an income payment. You're not getting paid for your service when you were in the military. You're getting paid because you became disabled in the service, and this is a replacement for a lawsuit in tort. And a lawsuit in tort pays a lump sum capital payment to you. So how can we tax something as income when it's not income, it's capital? It would have been really nice if they had us spelled it all out in the income tax. Now, the other major point about that is, and I thought of this years ago when I was thinking about selling CRA about the way they treated me. And in the Sun Life policy, it says they're going to deduct damages from, if you sue someone and you get damages, then they'll deduct it from your long-term disability. And I thought to myself, you know, that don't seem very fair. If the one I sue happens to be the one I work for, and the insurance I'm getting is the insurance from who I work for, I think that's fucking the heights of dirt. Now, that's just common sense. But lo and behold, there is a legal reason for that. Why should the person who injured you get a break? They could have left you alone. If they had not injured you, they wouldn't have had to pay you damages. So why should they benefit in any way at all? If you had insurance and they deduct it from your damages, they're benefiting. If you have tort damages and, they, and the insurance deducts the tort damages from your insurance and it happens to be your employer's insurance, then your employer who injured you is saving money. Going further, because I was talking about taxes, the government is a large employer. The government has a lot of people that are insured. So if they hurt someone, like in the Dennis Manoj class action, okay, they were clawing back the pension when they shouldn't have. So they caused contractual damages to the class. So when the class was ordered to pay taxes, or just everybody assumed that taxes would apply, then the people who wronged the disabled and service veteran saved at their expenses through the abuse of the tax system. Now, I submit to you that that's garbage. Even if normally they would tax it, they should say, well, we're the guilty party here. We're the ones that were found guilty by the judge. So you know what? We're not going to tax these payments. So by applying Income Tax Act Section 61F, the government mitigated its damages. Now, as I said, 
I'm going to call it quits there. Hopefully it was a bit enjoyable or at least not too boring. And I'll see you next week.